Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion. This is uh, Sean Carney. I'm a partner at Hill House based in New York, involved in our global buyout activity. I'm really pleased to introduce our guest today, Mark Wiseman, a global investment manager. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Sean. Uh, delighted to be here with uh, you and the Hill House team. Maybe a place to start is to sort of with the sort of the observation that the investors are navigating a very fast evolving and turbulent macro environment. Um, in inflation, interest rate hikes that have unsettled capital markets, geopolitical risks that have that have spillover effects to the global economy, investor sentiment, um, of course, and and uh, people have observed the thickening borders, so to speak, uh, via protectionist trade measures that have disrupted supply chains. Uh, in brief, it's a it's a very complex environment uh, that we face. So, Mark, maybe you could start just by commenting on how you how you assess the current backdrop. How might institutional investors navigate the choppy waters that we all face? Look, I think you are. I think you're absolutely right. In my two and a half uh, decades as a professional investor and allocator, um, I can tell you that this is by far, by far, uh, the most complex and dis difficult time. Uh, to invest, and even more so than the global financial crisis. And that's for two reasons, uh, two principal reasons. And, and I do believe that this time is different. I do think that things have changed uh, fundamentally. First, um, as you alluded to, um, the interest rate environment and everything that goes with that um, has fundamentally changed. We were in a world uh, for uh, more than a decade um, where it was lower for longer and maybe lower forever. And we became very, very accustomed to a low interest rate environment. And now, um, due to uh, inflationary pressure, uh, due to contention in uh, supply chains that you referenced, um, we have seen uh, the macroeconomic environment and the reaction by central banks uh, change fundamentally. And that fundamental change has seen a rapid increase in, uh, in interest rates. Uh, maybe now it's higher for longer, uh, not lower for longer. Um, and that has a fundamental impact on the repricing and reassessment of every single asset class uh, around the world. And I, I believe that we are still in the early innings uh, of that repricing uh, due to the raise uh, the rise in the um, uh, in the interest rate uh, environment and uh, relatedly persistent inflation. Second, um, Geopolitics matter, and they matter uh, more today than certainly any time in my investment career. And I would argue that geopolitics today uh, matter more than any time uh, in my lifetime. Uh, we have a serious uh, and large-scale kinetic war in Europe. We have tensions uh, between China and the West. Uh, and we have a uh, serious reshuffling of power uh, in the Middle East. Those three things alone um, have a big impact on the world, but the nature of what they are also has a big impact on investors and uh, the flow of capital. So today as an investor, uh, the playbook that you had for the last, in my case, 25 years, uh, doesn't seem to work anymore. And you need to be rethinking that playbook, rethinking how you allocate capital, and rethinking what the world is going to look like um, in what may be uh, a new normal. And if it's not the new normal, uh, certainly in these very, very uncertain economic and geopolitical times. Mark, you've, you you talked about a couple areas of, of change, and also noted, uh, of course, the different uh, you know important important geographies. It's interesting to pick up on that and think about after you know decades of correlated market performance across markets and across geographies, we're now seeing geographic dispersion that is increasing 
uh, in importance in portfolio allocation. What, what do you think are some of the more important points to think about uh, and consider in this industry shift? Yeah, well, I'm going to make two points here, Sean. Um, you know, the first is um, the first is is that let's remind ourselves that diversification is the only free lunch in investing. Um, and there is, you know, people say there is no free lunch, but diversification uh, you can create portfolios. Uh, you know, if you go back to uh, Finance 101 uh, through diversification, you can create portfolios that either have the same return and lower risk characteristics or uh, similar risk characteristics and higher return through the use of diversification. And, and we learned that uh, in, in early days. Now, getting diversification um, has been it, quite difficult uh, in the low interest rate and sort of in the uh, sort of reasonably neutral geopolitical uh, environment. But today, diversification, I believe, matters more than ever. It means diversifying uh, across asset classes, um, but it also means diversifying uh, against uh, uh, and across uh, various geographies. So you will get a benefit today. We've had, uh, you know, in a globalized world, for example, we had markets that were highly, highly correlated uh, to one another. And therefore, the benefit and value of diversification um, was, um, was much lower. Today, there is no doubt um, that, for instance, uh, you know, China is not going to move in parallel its economy, its markets, et cetera, um, with the United States. Japan's not going to move in parallel uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, Europe uh, is not going to move uh, in the same direction as North America. So you can now get, as a professional investor, um, much, much more value from diversifying across geography and asset classes than you were able to get uh, before. And I think investors shouldn't lose sight of that fact. Um, and there's this, you know, there may be this natural inclination um, to kind of retrench into you, uh, your home market, wherever that home market may be. But I would argue today, uh, there's more value to diversification than there has been uh, in, uh, in, in, in recent years. So with the uh, with the markets moving in the the different geographies moving in the directions that you nicely articulated, plus of course the deglobalization that we've talked about, how how do you actually see uh, portfolio allocation evolving, long term portfolio allocation evolving across these markets? Well, look, I I think it's 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 it, as I say it's it's very challenging because I think no one really knows, but I do think if you are the CIO of a family office, an endowment, a pension fund, a sovereign fund, uh, you have to challenge uh, some of the assumptions that we've had for the last several decades. You know, does the 60-40 uh, does the portfolio uh, still hold true? If you think about it, um, let's just think about the, the, the higher rate environment. If the risk-free rate is 5.5% um, and you believe that you need uh, something like 400 basis points as an equity risk premium, you know, just to stand still with equities, that means a uh, nine and a half uh, percent uh, return. And we're not even talking real dollars. That's nominal. Um, uh, and on the other hand, um, you now get returns uh, by uh, investing in, in fixed income that we haven't really uh, seen. Um, so the query, does that 60-40 portfolio um, still makes sense today, or should you uh, be looking at at something different? On the other hand, um, when you look at uh, uh, dispersion among asset classes beyond just equities and fixed income, um, you have to think about things, structural things going on uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, capital markets. Do you need a higher allocation to credit uh, in these uh, in these markets? What of uh, the private uh, asset classes? And then again, to return what we just talked about, um, well, there is this sort of initial kind of knee-jerk reaction uh, to bring capital home and to uh, perhaps have a little bit more home country bias or home region bias in your portfolio. Um, you're giving up the diversification benefit, the free lunch uh, that has finally appeared that hasn't really been there 
uh, for the for the past uh, a couple of decades. So I think all of the fundamental assumptions that CIOs have had uh, need to be challenged. Uh, I think the risk metrics and measures that we've used um, to measure our portfolios uh, need to be challenged. Um, and I think the traditional measures of volatility that we've used to to look at our look at risk in our portfolio uh, need to be uh, much more so than before um, augmented, including in by scenario planning, uh, et cetera, given the geopolitical situation. Mark, maybe just to take that and put a put a lens, shift a, a little bit of the focus and put a lens on the private markets um, and how you think in that in in that uh, sort of environment, how you think private markets will perform over the over the short and long term. What do you what do you see on the private market side? Anything as we come, you know, out of this um, this sort of political and economic uncertainty. Um, I think private markets will be, become that much more attractive. However, and it's an important however, um, the liquidity uh, required um, or, or the ability to live with the lack of liquidity as an investor in, uh, in private markets is becoming that much more important. As much as we have increasingly robust secondary markets, et cetera, um, the reality is that in these types of environments, uh, liquidity becomes uh, tight. And we've seen the velocity of money in private markets slow down substantially. So what's happening is there's less distributions. If there's less distributions, there's less new capital to commit uh, to, uh, to private markets. And the whole system uh, slows down. And so I think that the returns to private markets um, are going to continue on a risk-adjusted basis uh, to, in the long run, significantly outperform. But investors have to be that much more careful managing liquidity and ensuring that that delta between public and private um, is enough to pay them. And, a, and in addition to just sort of the risk-adjusted return um, in a liquidity, an illiquidity risk premium. Um, and, you know, I think that illiquidity risk premium in, in recent times, uh, you know, pre-COVID was somewhere close to zero uh, because there was so much velocity of capital in private markets. Um, today, with that lower velocity of capital, you know, that illiquidity risk premium is probably, you know, 100 basis points or more. And you have to make sure you're getting paid for it. Mark, you've been a big uh, proponent in your in your uh, career around uh, you know focusing capital on the long term. Um, I was hoping maybe you could just comment on you know your thoughts on whether comp you think companies are, are are doing enough to emphasize and talk about their long term strategies and investment plans, and and if not, what uh, what are some things that uh, that you see better companies do or things that companies could do better in that respect. Yeah, well, you know, I was uh, a co-founder of an organization called Focusing Capital in the Long Term, as 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 you know, uh, something I'm 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 proud of, and I think we've made some progress in that regard. But I think at the end of the day, public companies in particular, and private companies as well, but public companies in particular, continue to be focused on uh, on the next uh, quarter. Um, and you know, having run a pension fund, for example, for for us you know, a quarter was 25 years, uh, not 90 days. And I think increasingly um, you are seeing companies, you know, understand, especially around uh, sustainability and environmental, social and governance factors that long-termism uh, creates a more resilient enterprise, leads to better returns and so on and so forth. But the pressures, uh, in particular of the public corporation, uh, to meet, you know, quarterly returns, the way that we incent uh, managers, uh, the way that um, the stock market operates, 
uh, tends to pull us away from that um, that objective and that optimization um, to making decisions that are much more short term in nature. And so I think we have to continue. Um, I think we have to continue to push against it. Um, I think things like you know quarterly guidance in public corporations is is of no value uh, to a long term uh, investor. Um, I think we have to think about how uh, how managers are incented and how how boards of directors are incented uh, in terms of stock price uh, instead of looking at long term total uh, shareholder uh, return. I mean, in short, part of it is taking. Um, if we want to be more long term, taking that private capital, that private equity model, and applying it um, to uh, to public corporations. But I think thinking long term is more important today than it ever uh, has been. You, at some level, have to see through the current dislocations that we talked about, um, and at the same time, you have to be able to look around the bend. And see things like the like the environmental changes that are taking place in the world, and understand how they're going to affect uh, your portfolio. And and you know we talked about risk a lot. What are the long term risks um, to your portfolio from things like uh, uh, you know increasing temperature in the world, increasing sea levels, uh, et, et cetera. So we've made some progress there, but I still think that most investors are far too short term in their thinking relative to their liabilities or uh, or interests.